fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for letting me be a part of your scripture study or lesson prep this week. My goal is to help you to either teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. And this week, we're going to be studying Jacob chapters 1 through 4. Remember, teachers, if you're interested in getting access to the materials that I put together for teachers to help reduce your preparation time, increase your confidence in the classroom, and help you to create edifying classroom experiences, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. Now, if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. Now, for these particular chapters, I usually like to start with a bit of an overview section of the lesson. So, for an icebreaker, I like to present my class with a few brain teasers or story problems to see if they can figure out their solutions. They're going to need to use their problem-solving skills to find the answers. And I've got three of them. So, our first one, two fathers and two sons went fishing one day. They were there the whole day and only caught three fish. One father said, that's enough for all of us. We will each have one. How can that be possible? Now, the answer, and go ahead and pause the video if you want a little more time to think. But the answer is, there was the father, his son, and his son's son. That equals two fathers and two sons for a total of three. Because one of those men was both a father and a son at the same time, right? Okay, let's try another one. This one's one's a little bit tougher. What makes this number unique? Eight, five, four, nine, one, seven, six, three, two, zero. The answer is that it has each number, but more than that, at 0 through 9, listed in alphabetical order. If you were to spell those numbers out, it's an alphabetical order. It's a tough one. And uh, and one more, one more fun one here. An Arab sheik is old and must leave his fortune to one of his two sons. He makes a proposition. Both sons will ride their camels in a race, and whichever camel crosses the finish line last will win the fortune for its owner. During the race, the two brothers wander aimlessly for days, neither willing to cross the finish line. In desperation, they ask a wise man for advice. He tells them something, and then the brothers leap onto the camels and charge towards the finish line. What did the wise man say? Answer. The rules of the race were that the owner of the camel that crosses the finish line last wins the fortune. The wise man simply told them to switch camels. So there we go. Now we're all warmed up to use our problem solving skills. And we're going to need them today because the scriptures often present us with people who are are experiencing problems or difficult situations. And then we're invited to liken the scriptures unto ourselves. But I've also found that the scriptures will almost never present a problem without the solution appearing somewhere nearby. So if we find ourselves struggling with any of the same kinds of problems, the scriptures can help us to see how we can solve our problems. And that's the case with these first four chapters of Jacob. And I'm going to provide you with a little bit of background here. Uh, To set the stage, Jacob, the younger brother of Nephi, has now become the new spiritual leader of the Nephites. And sadly, the people have started to manifest a number of different morally perilous issues, problems. He says in Jacob chapter 2, verse 5, that they were beginning to labor in sin. Which is an interesting expression when you think about it, because typically we look at sin as the path of least resistance, as the thing which comes most easily to our natural man. But Jacob turns that thought on its head by suggesting that sin is something that you have to work at or labor in. I might pair that thought with Paul's words 
in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, where he says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You got to earn the consequences of sin, work at it. It's labor, but the reward of righteousness is a gift. Perhaps in a way saying that righteousness really is the easier path to travel in the long run. Now the Nephites are beginning to labor in sin and Jacob, as their prophet, wants to help. He's going to give them some counsel, going to correct them. He says in chapter two, verse three, that he's weighed down with much more desire and anxiety for the welfare of your souls. This talk he's going to give seems like a difficult thing for him to do. Later in verse seven, he says, it grieveth me that I must use so much boldness of speech concerning you. And in verse nine, wherefore it burdeneth my soul that I should be constrained because of the strict commandment, which I have received from God to admonish you according to your crimes. So uh, let's discover what those crimes or problems are. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time focusing on Jacob's counsel on how to solve those problems. Can you identify the three main problems Jacob's people are laboring in by studying the following verses? Jacob 2, 12 and 13, and Jacob 2, 23, and Jacob 3, 9. What are the problems? Jacob 2, 12 through 13 can also see it in chapter 1, verse 16. And now behold, my brethren, this is the word which I declare unto you, that many of you have begun to search for gold and for silver and for all manner of precious ores, in the which this land, which is a land of promise unto you and to your seed, doth abound most plentifully. And the hand of providence hath smiled upon you most pleasingly, that you have obtained many riches. And because some of you have obtained more abundantly than that of your brethren, ye are lifted up in the pride of your hearts, and wear stiff necks and high heads because of the costliness of your apparel, and persecute your brethren, because ye suppose that ye are better than they. Problem number one is materialism and the pride that so often accompanies it. They're striving to become rich or at least richer than their fellow man. Our next problem, Jacob 2, 23. You can also see this in chapter 1, verse 15. But the word of God burdens me because of your grosser crimes. For behold, thus saith the Lord, this people begin to wax in iniquity. They understand not the scriptures, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of the things which were written concerning David and Solomon, his son. Problem number two is sexual immorality. They're using Old Testament plural marriage practices as an excuse for committing whoredoms or sexual sin. And then finally, Jacob chapter three, verse nine, wherefore a commandment I give unto you, which is the word of God, that ye revile no more against them because of the darkness of their skins neither shall ye revile against them because of their filthiness. But ye shall remember your own filthiness and remember that their filthiness came because of their fathers. What's our final problem? What do we call reviling somebody because of their skin color or their culture? Racism and prejudice. They hate and revile the Lamanites because of the way they live and, and differences in their physical appearance. Before we tackle these specific problems, quick note, go to Jacob chapter one and consider what he says right at the beginning of the chapter. Starting in verse two, he tells us, and he, Nephi, gave me, Jacob, a commandment that I should write upon these plates a few of the things which I considered to be most precious, that I should not touch, save it were lightly, concerning the history of this people, which are called the people of Nephi. For he said that the history of his people should be engraven upon his other plates, and that I should preserve these plates and hand them down unto my seed from generation to generation. And if there were preaching which was sacred, 
or revelation, which was great, or prophesying, that I should engrave in the heads of them upon these plates, and touch upon them as much as it were possible, for Christ's sake and for the sake of our people. Also consider this, Jacob 3.13, And a hundredth part of the proceedings of this people, which now began to be numerous, cannot be written upon these plates. And then 4.1, Jacob talks about the difficulty of engraving our words upon plates. So we know that Jacob was only able to write a little of the history of his people because of the difficulty of engraving on metal plates. And the things that he did include were those things that he felt would be the most precious, most sacred, and most important. The most important things to pass on to future generations. He knew that his record was going to be read far into the future, including our day. So we can rest assured that what we do find in Jacob is only going to be that which he considered to be most relevant, most beneficial for those that were going to read it. And let's see if that holds true here for us. Take a look at that list of problems. How did Jacob do? Is he touching on problems that are relevant to our day? Materialism, immorality, and racism. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think he hit it pretty good. Many nations in the latter days face these very issues. As I reflect upon my own nation, the United States, all three of these have been and continue to be major issues for our society. And that just strengthens my conviction that the Book of Mormon was indeed written for our day, that its writers were inspired to record and cover the specific things that they do cover. Jacob's message is needed in our world. It's going to help us out with some solutions, some advice, some counsel to overcome these problems here. Today, we're going to take a look at each one in turn. As a teacher, if you only have one lesson to teach, you're not going to be able to do all of them. So you may have to seek the Spirit to choose which ones you want to cover or shorten each one, summarize them. Problem number one. I'm going to go to Jacob number two. Uh, materialism. First, how relevant do you see this particular issue? Either in your nation, your community, or most importantly, your own life. Do you see any evidence of materialism in these areas? I definitely see it in my country. It seems that the sizes of our houses, our cars, and the amount of our stuff just continues to grow and grow. And are we working longer and longer hours to make more money while neglecting family, personal, or spiritual responsibilities? Are we tempted to compromise our honesty, our integrity, our sense of charity in the name of pursuing wealth? And the media. Ah, media only seems to perpetuate materialistic desires by constantly bombarding us with messages that equate happiness with ownership. That fixation on the tangible only perpetuates a cycle of constant desire for more and more. And sadly, it cultivates a dissatisfaction with the blessings that we already do have. You know, the problem that we have here isn't so much the prosperity itself. I don't believe that prosperity is a bad thing, necessarily. If it was, I don't imagine that God would ever reward a hardworking, righteous people with it. But he often does. In fact, a repeated promise of the Book of Mormon is that if you're righteous, you will prosper in the land. Mosiah 2.22 is an example of that. And I assume that this means both spiritual and temporal prosperity. I also believe that God would prefer for us to experience an abundant life. Not an excessive one, but abundant. He tells us that in Doctrine and Covenants 49.19. For behold, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and that which cometh of the earth is ordained for the use of man, for food and for raiment, and that he might have in abundance. Doctrine and Covenants also teaches us that God wants us to have sufficient to support our families. 
our circumstances, our needs, and our wants, even. Doctrine and Covenants 51.3. Inasmuch as our wants are just, right? Doctrine and Covenants 82.17, or reasonable. I guess that's kind of the problem with the term. Uh, abundance is a relative term. The problem with prosperity is not in God's giving it to us, but how we respond to it or how the adversary uses that situation to try and ensnare us. And that's what he always does with every blessing of God. He, he takes the good things of God and tempts us to pursue them at the wrong time, in the wrong way, or to the wrong degree. And how does Satan use prosperity against us? Look back to that verse, uh, Jacob 2.13. And, and I've created a little scripture math here, a scripture equation. And see if you can fill this in using what you read. I call this equation the three P's of prosperity. Prosperity leads to a word that begins with P, which leads to another word that begins with P. Look at verse 13. And the hand of providence hath smiled upon you most pleasingly. Providence, we could say, is another P word that means the same thing as prosperity. So you could put that in that place as well. But as the hand of providence hath smiled upon you most pleasingly, that you have obtained many riches, and because some of you have obtained more abundantly than that of your brethren, ye are lifted up in the pride of your hearts, and wear stiff necks and high heads because of the costliness of your apparel, and persecute your brethren because ye suppose that ye are better than they. The problem with prosperity is that when people obtain more abundantly than others, it often leads them to a faulty conclusion. I have more than you, therefore I am better than you. We call that pride. Prosperity leads to pride, universal sin. Sadly, the problem doesn't stop there. The adversary leads the prideful, prosperous, further down the path of sin to our next peak. And what's that? persecution. Because I have more than you, and I'm better than you, then I'm going to treat you differently, treat you poorly. I'm going to lord it over you, ignore you, ostracize you, exploit you for my own gain. That's the problem with prosperity. And ultimately, that can lead to a final step we could add, but it doesn't start with a P. What eventually will this attitude do to our souls, according to Jacob 2.16? It can destroy your soul. And maybe we could add that as another P. Prosperity leads to pride, which leads to persecution, which will eventually cause our souls to perish. Brigham Young had something interesting to say about this. When the saints first settled in the Salt Lake Valley, Brother Brigham had a major concern about the saints. He expressed his biggest fear. After all the trials the saints had been asked to endure up to that point, what do you think was his biggest worry? Some might guess that it would be persecution, uh, crop failure, attack, Mormon crickets, or drought. No, no, no. What was, what was Brigham Young's biggest fear? The worst fear I have about this people is that they will get rich in this country forget God and his people, wax fat, and kick themselves out of the church and go to hell. This people will stand mobbing, robbing, poverty, and all manner of persecution, and be true. But my greater fear is that they cannot stand well. <laughs> Nobody could say it quite like Brother Brigham, right? Well, Jacob doesn't want that to happen to his people or to us, so he's going to give us some help. Remember that the problem isn't so much the prosperity, but our reaction to it, or the pride that accompanies it. I do believe that it is possible to be rich and righteous, both wealthy and worthy. I know of people that fit that description. The trick is to change the equation, to break the cycle, to learn how to live in prosperity without getting prideful. That's the key. Jacob is going to give anybody who has the intention of seeking wealth some cautions.
I call it the can I be rich test. Can I stand wealth test? We've got to recognize that we have to be able to approach prosperity with a certain mindset or we're never going to be able to handle it. It will destroy our souls. We don't even want to think about becoming rich before we can pass this test. And the word rich here doesn't necessarily mean how much we've accumulated in our bank accounts, but a reflection of how we relate to material goods and money. Rich can be a relative term. I like Spencer W. Kimball's definition of rich. We say that he is rich whose accumulations are sufficiently great to blind him to his spiritual and moral obligations and to render him slave instead of master. To help us see the Can I Be Rich test more clearly, I've put together a handout based on Jacob's teachings found in chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. The handout's not only going to help us to study this section of Scripture, but invites us to liken the Scriptures as we go. And we can approach this test in two ways. I haven't actually included the questions themselves, but the verses and particular phrases in which the questions come from. That gives you freedom as a teacher to evaluate the scriptural proficiency of your students. If you want to challenge them a bit, you can invite them to go through and seek to come up with the questions themselves. Or you could read each verse or phrase together as a class, and then you provide them with questions as a teacher and encourage them to write those questions in as you're going. Whichever way you decide to do it, there's an invitation to self-assess on each question. You're going to invite them to evaluate themselves on a scale from one to five on how they would rank their attitude towards seeking wealth. Here's how the scale's broken down. One, absolutely. Two, I think so. Three, not sure. Four, I don't think so. And five, no or nope. <laughs> Here we go. Question number one comes from verse 17, and the statement, Think of your brethren like unto yourselves. Question, then, Are you able to think of your brethren like unto yourselves? Are you able to resist the temptation to think that because you have more, that you're better? So easy and natural for us to arrive at that conclusion. If we plan on getting rich, Let's be sure that we start with the fundamental truth that earning more money will never make us better, more valuable than anybody else. Can we always think of our brethren like unto ourselves, regardless of our differences in fortune? We can't equate wealth with work. So rank yourself on that question. Can you do that? One through five. Question number two also comes from verse 17. And the statement, Be familiar with all, and free with your substance, that they may be rich like unto you. So the question, Are you able to give of your wealth freely to others, so that they may be rich like unto you? That's often a very difficult one for the prosperous to accept. Because they find their value in that comparison. That's why they feel prideful. If others became rich like us, then we're no longer going to feel superior. There's no reason to feel like we're better. So we may be really good at making money, but how good are we at giving it away? If we find it difficult to be familiar and free, we should probably try to stay away from wealth. My favorite way of describing this dynamic is with the analogy of the house. If you've studied with me for a while, you've heard me talk about this one before. I use it when I teach the Law of Consecration in the Doctrine and Covenants, and I use it when I teach the parable of the rich fool in the New Testament. But imagine a large house. That house represents a family's needs and righteous wants. But what do we do when that gets full? What if we start to bring forth in abundance? We've got a problem here. There's no more room for our abundance. Same problem encountered by the rich fool back in the Gospels. His solution was to build bigger barns to fit all of his abundance. God calls that a foolish solution. 
do we get to the point that we don't even know what to do with all we've been blessed with? And therefore, our solution is to buy bigger and better things, to spend more and more extravagantly. There is no end to excess. Is there another solution to our house problem, though? Yeah, there is. Open up the back door and start to shovel the abundance out. And how do we shovel it out? Lots of opportunities. Tithing, fast offerings, humanitarian aid, the missionary fund, direct help to struggling family and friends, educational and cultural opportunities, disaster relief efforts, charities that help people in developing countries. There are many opportunities to give. And not surprisingly, guess what happens when there is somebody out there that's willing to shovel abundance out the back door? And I think God says to himself, here we have a rare individual, somebody that can be satisfied with enough and is willing to give, who can be free and familiar with their substance to others. And so God starts shoveling the abundance in more and more quickly into the front door. So what do you got to do? Shovel it out the back just as quickly. I believe that if we can develop this ability to open the back door and be familiar and free with our substance, then we're going to find the Lord enthusiastically supporting our righteous endeavors. Question number three comes from verse 18. But before ye seek for riches, seek ye for the kingdom of God. Now that's an interesting phrase that I think is often misinterpreted. Does, does that mean chronologically or in terms of priority? I think it's priority. I don't think it means that I go out, get my testimony, find the Lord's kingdom, get to the temple, make my covenants, and now I can go out and get on with the business of making money. I think it means that no matter what age or circumstances we find ourselves in, we always put the kingdom of God first. So if there's a conflict between riches and the kingdom of God, I put the kingdom of God first. If I find there's a conflict between making a greater profit and being honest, I choose to be honest because I seek the kingdom of God first. If there's a conflict between honoring my family and church commitments and making extra income, I honor my commitments because I seek the kingdom of God first. If there's a conflict between paying my tithing and the desire to pad my investments, I pay my tithing because I seek the kingdom of God first. So our question here is, will the kingdom of God always be your first priority? Question number four from verse 19. And after ye have obtained a hope in Christ, ye shall obtain riches if ye seek them. So the question, have you obtained a hope in Christ? What does it mean to obtain a hope in Christ? Now, Jacob explains that in Jacob 4, verse 6, and also 11. Wherefore, we search the prophets, and we have many revelations and the spirit of prophecy. And having all these witnesses, we obtain a hope. So Jacob gives us something different to seek for. If we feel the need to search for something, we should make it riches. But the words of the prophets and revelations and a testimony of Jesus Christ. Obtain that hope in Christ. That has to be our center, our foundation, our priority. And if it's not, then maybe we should take Jacob's counsel to heart. Question number five, also from verse 19. And you will seek them for the intent to do good. The question is, is the reason you want to obtain riches so that you can do good with them? Is that the end goal? And if that is the case, then we're not even really seeking riches, are we? What we're really seeking is to do good. Jacob's inviting us to examine the motivation behind our quest for wealth. Is it bigger houses, nicer cars, better clothes? Or do we want riches to do good things? And if we're not sure what kind of good that we can do with them, Jacob gives us a few ideas. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, liberate the captive, administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. 
That harkens back to our house analogy. Seek riches so that we can fulfill our needs and wants and still be able to shovel a lot of blessings and opportunities out the back door to fulfill the needs and wants of others. Question number six comes from verse 20, where Jacob says, And now, my brethren, I have spoken unto you concerning pride, and those of you which have afflicted your neighbor, and persecuted him because you were proud in your hearts, of the things which God hath given you. What say ye of it? Now, I can't help but put the emphasis like that. I, I emphasize the phrase, the things which God hath given you. I think he's reminding them of a certain principle. Everything that they have is a gift from God. When we obtain wealth, it's easy to make the assumption that we are the creators of our own prosperity, that it's ours because we worked for it. But we forget that the ultimate source of all things, all our abilities, all our talents, all our opportunities, the circumstances under which we've been placed in life is God. Do we understand and believe that everything we have really is a gift? Now, that's such an, an important idea. If we can just buy into that principle, the sacrifices that we're asked to make, they become so much easier. When God asks for 10% of our income for tithing, we say, oh, sure, Lord, I can give you 10% of what's yours. That's easy. Or when he asks us to give a generous fast offering or to use our means to bless others or the poor, uh, we can say, no, no problem, Lord. You want me to use your money to bless your children? Hey, I'd be happy to do that. So our question here is, do you recognize that all you have and will have is a gift from God? Question number seven is from verse 21. Jacob reminds them of the principle that all people are precious in God's sight and that they have all been created for the same purpose. That purpose? That they should keep his commandments and glorify him forever. So the final question is, do you understand that the purpose of your life is obedience to God and a dedication to his glory, as opposed to obedience to our own appetites and a dedication to our own glory and building up our own kingdom? So, so those are the questions, one through seven. How did you do? Did you pass? Can you handle wealth? Did you answer the test with more ones and twos or with a lot of, of threes, fours, and fives? Maybe that can help us to assess whether seeking wealth is, is really even something we want to pursue with a lot of effort. Our truth. Prosperity can be hazardous to our spiritual health. Approach with extreme caution. And for an I will go and do, did the test inspire you to make any changes in any way? Well, if we had to answer Jacob's questions with a lot of threes, fours, and fives, then my suggestion would be that we probably ought to play it safe and avoid the procurement of great wealth. Better that we focus our attention and efforts on obtaining a hope in Christ and seeking the kingdom of God beyond the desire to provide sufficient for our families, circumstances, wants, and needs. Now, if you had a lot of ones and twos while taking that test, well, then, you know what? I, I pray that the Lord will bless you with great abundance, millions even, because the, I'm positive that you'll be able to do a lot of good. All right, problem number two, sexual immorality. For an object lesson, if you can, have a piano somewhere nearby. For me, this is easy because I often teach in a seminary classroom or at church, and typically there's a piano in the room somewhere nearby. If you don't have access to a piano, you can always display a picture of one. And then for an icebreaker, I might play a piece of beautiful music for a minute and just have them listen to it. Not, not myself. I, I can't play the piano very well. I just, I just play it from my computer. A piece by Rachmaninoff comes to mind. But then I explain 
that in order for a piano to make beautiful music, it requires somebody to play the notes in the right order at the right time. And I would invite a student up to the piano and, and give them the following challenge. Point out to me which notes are the wrong ones. Show me one of the bad notes. Let them wrestle with that for a minute. And if they do choose a note, I would ask them to explain why. Why that note? What's wrong with it? What makes it bad? Are you telling me that any piece of music that has that note in it is going to be a bad piece of music? It's going to sound wrong? And ultimately, the point that you're making is that there is no such thing as a bad note in and of itself. Only notes played at the wrong time or at the wrong volume. I'd then like to share this quote from C.S. Lewis. He used the metaphor of a piano to teach a profound lesson about the impulses and the instincts that we feel as mortals. He said, think of a piano. It's not got two kinds of notes on it, the right notes and the wrong ones. Every single note is right at one time and wrong at another. The moral law is not any one instinct or any set of instincts. It is something which makes a kind of tune. The tune we call goodness or right conduct by directing the instincts. Well, there's one of those notes that I'd like to focus on here, an instinct that is sometimes maligned and very often misunderstood, and that is the sexual instinct. And there are various messages that are given in the world about sex, which can be especially confusing to young people. I think that in the church sometimes, if we're not careful, we might send the message that sex or sexual desire is something shameful, embarrassing, bad in some way. But then the world sends the exact opposite message. To the world, it's kind of a free-for-all. Play that note all the time. It's good. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just human. But they use that to excuse casual, intimate relationships, sex before marriage, a pornography-saturated media, multiple partners throughout life, widespread adultery, and then just an overall focus on sensuality. So what is it? Is sex bad or good? Back to our metaphor of the piano. No, sex and sexual desire are not bad. It's a note on the piano. It has a purpose. God tells us that there is a right time and a right place and a proper circumstance to play that note. Play the note at the wrong time? It can mess up a very beautiful piece of music in life. Therefore, we as disciples of Christ believe that there are laws governing sexual desire, and we call it morality. And when we play the piece of music right, our lives will be far more harmonious and delightful than they would be otherwise quick caution here. Jacob's words are very strong against sexual sin in this section. It doesn't mince words, but that's what his particular audience really needed to hear at that time. So if you're teaching this, it's possible that there might be somebody in your presence who has committed sexual sin. Please be careful. Please be sensitive. The gospel is a message of hope and change, forgiveness. Don't forget to balance this strong message of chastity with a healthy dose of hope. At some point in the lesson, preferably near the beginning, remember that we can be forgiven of our sins. God promises to forget them even. An individual who has committed sexual sin is still loved and valued by their heavenly Father. The power of God's mercy and forgiveness is one of the great messages of the Book of Mormon. In fact, in Alma chapter 39, later this year, we're going to see a great example of a father helping his son through the repentance process after committing sexual sin. And it is full of hope and love. Don't forget that as we study this chapter. But your class should understand that the purpose of this lesson is to help all of us to understand the gravity of these things, since the world says just the opposite. We, we can't afford to be subtle with this message or to hold back because the world certainly isn't subtle with its message. First, before we examine the solutions, let's just discuss the problem really quick. What are the consequences of 
immorality. The world diminishes them, plays them down. What are the consequences? Have your students just discuss that for a minute. What negative things come from playing the sexual desire note at the wrong time? A few thoughts. Unwanted pregnancies, abortions, sexually transmitted diseases, broken marriages, broken homes, lost worthiness, lost blessings, loss of the spirit, weaker communities and societies, as the family is the fundamental strength of any nation or population. But this lesson is more about solutions. So what are the solutions to immorality? What truths are going to help us to maintain the sanctity and sacredness of sexual relations between man and wife? I just approach this as an open-ended scripture search. Invite your students to listen to Jacob 2, 22 through 35. I would probably just play a recording of it from the church's scripture website, or even right from your phone. I won't go into the specifics of how to do that because I know we've talked about that before. But as they listen, they should be seeking for solutions. What are they? Here are a couple of my thoughts. Uh, uh, one, there's a specific message about immorality that seems to come up quite a bit in this section. Did you notice the kind of language that Jacob uses to describe immorality and the effect it was having? As I share these, I want you to ask yourself what you think is the big overarching message Jacob is sending to his people about sexual sin. 2.22, grosser crimes. Verse 24, which thing was abominable? 31, wickedness and abominations. 33, led away captive. Also 33, a sore curse. 34, great condemnation. And then we, we can maybe add one from chapter 3, verse 12. I'll throw this in there. Awful consequences. What do you think? What do you feel these words and phrases suggest about sexual sin? Playing that note at the wrong time, with the wrong person, or to the wrong degree. To me, from the language that Jacob uses, we can see that he considers this to be a very serious thing. In a world that minimizes immorality, justifies it, revels in it even. Jacob reminds us that it's not something to be taken lightly. God's laws of sexual purity are not to be trifled with. The power to create life is sacred to our Heavenly Father. And there are firm rules in place for how and when it's used. We know that taking life is a very serious thing because, because life is precious to our Father in Heaven. So the rules and the consequences for that are very strict, very severe. By the same token, the rules and consequences governing the powers of creating life are also very strict and serious. Number two, a related idea that may serve as a solution is to understand the effects that your decisions may have on other people. Just look at all the consequences in this section. Most of them are felt by individuals other than the offender. Verse 8, the wounded soul. Verse 9, daggers placed to pierce their souls and wound their delicate minds. I just added those two. I know they're not from the section that we read, but I wanted to add those in. Verse 31, I, the Lord, have seen the sorrow and heard the mourning of the daughters of my people. 32, the cries of the fair daughters. Verse 35, broken the hearts of your tender wives, lost the confidence of your children, sobbings of their hearts. Hearts died. Deep wounds. And we can take one from chapter 3, verse 10. Grieve hearts. Something that might help us to think twice before we play that note at the wrong time is to consider the effect that that decision may have on other people. The effect that it has on spouses and children, in particular, present or future. The effect it might have on the life that could be created through immoral actions, the effect it might have on those who see or follow our example. All of our decisions have ripple effects on the people that are around us. 
though we may be tempted to say, well, it's my decision, I'm only hurting myself. I'm afraid that that's simply wishful thinking. Third solution. I like how Jacob says in verse 23 that they seek to excuse themselves. The solution is not to seek to excuse yourself. Never justify sexual sin. What are some of the excuses that people make today for immoral behavior? But we're in love. <laughs> it's not that big a deal. It's too hard to control. You can always repent. And it's just natural. It just happened. And hopefully we never catch ourselves trying to make those kind of rationalizations. And then a fourth solution is so simple that it really needs no explanation. From verse 28, remember that God delights in chastity. And here he says the chastity of women because of the context of his audience. But we know that it's not just about women. Uh, in fact, this whole talk is directed at the men and their chastity issues. He delights in the principle of chastity. And what is the Lord's law of chastity? That sexual relations are reserved for marriage. That the purpose of sex and sexual desire is to bring children into the world and bring husbands and wives closer together. To make them one. To create a type of relationship between husbands and wives that is unique and special. Different from all other relationships. So our truth I'm going to put it in two statements here. God delights in chastity. And sexual sin is serious. For what I will go and do, what could a person do to show that they too delight in chastity? And in my opinion, they would follow the Lord's straightforward standard on sex. No sexual relations before marriage and then only with your spouse after marriage. That's it. It's pretty simple. But is there anything more a person could do? They could teach the law of chastity to their children and others. They could take a stand against pornography, not indulge in it themselves. They could be conscientious about the language that they use, the clothing that they wear, the media they consume. They could seek to control their thoughts even, as Jesus suggested on the Sermon on the Mount, that they not even look upon another person to lust after them and commit adultery in their hearts. Overall, they could cultivate a deep respect for the principle of chastity itself, for the opposite sex, and have a joyful yet reverent outlook on the desires that involve it. I personally am so grateful for the guidance that I've been blessed with throughout my life concerning sexual relations. The Lord's law of chastity has protected me from awful consequences. Consequences that I've seen come into the lives of others that I know and love. It's helped me to be, my life to be filled with happiness. I'm so grateful for a wife that has also lived a life committed to that law. Let's forget the world's way and its lies. It, the world's way just doesn't work. Don't let them minimize that law. Take the Lord's piano music and play the beautiful tune that he's composed for us. I believe that harmonious marriages and families and societies will be the ultimate result of playing the right notes at the right time and in the right order. A brief side note here. There's a verse here in Jacob 2 that touches on a sensitive and controversial topic in the Latter-day Church. Jacob tells us that the Nephite men of this time were using the excuse that because Old Testament men like David and Solomon, had plural wives, that they should be justified in having multiple sexual partners. However, Jacob understands that their motivation for living that lifestyle isn't pure. They want to do it for all the wrong reasons. Therefore, Jacob clearly teaches them the principle of monogamy in verse 27. For there shall not any man among you have, save it be, one wife. And concubines he shall have none. Now, they're right in the sense that there have been times in Earth's history when plural marriage has been acceptable and allowed by God. But it's the exception, not the rule. 
you and I know that plural marriage was practiced in the early church up until 1890 and has been the subject of much criticism by the world ever since. So why did the Lord allow, or in some cases even command, that it be lived during that time? I don't claim to have the definitive answer to that question, but Jacob chapter 2 verse 30 gives what I feel to be the best scriptural-based explanation for why God sometimes commands or allows plural marriage. He says, For if I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people to live polygamy. Otherwise, they shall hearken unto these things, monogamy. The key phrase there is, raise up seed unto me. Not just raise up seed, but seed unto me. One of the positive results of polygamy in the early church was that more children were able to be raised by the most faithful men and women. Under polygamy, many more children could be born to and raised by the most dedicated members of the church. Because it was only the most dedicated members of the church who were willing to agree to live that lifestyle with all of its accompanying challenges. But they did it because they had faith in their religion, in their prophets. And here, if you want a, a better understanding of polygamy in the early church, rather than going into all the particulars, I highly recommend that you read the Gospel Topics essay that's entitled Plural Marriage and Families in Early Utah. It's very good, very well done, and I'm going to give you a link to that in the video description below. I just want to share one paragraph. We don't want to have a whole lesson on polygamy here, but I, I do like to point this verse out. But this paragraph from that essay nicely sums up what I think Jacob is trying to get across here. For many who practiced it, plural marriage was a significant sacrifice. Despite the hardships some experienced, the faithfulness of those who practiced plural marriage continues to benefit the church in innumerable ways. Through the lineage of those 19th century saints have come many Latter-day Saints who have been faithful to their gospel covenants as righteous mothers and fathers, loyal disciples of Jesus Christ, and devoted church members, leaders, and missionaries. Although members of the contemporary church are forbidden to practice plural marriage, modern Latter-day Saints honor and respect these pioneers who gave so much for their faith, families, and community. Personally speaking, I am a descendant of pioneers who lived plural marriage. And I know that living plural marriage was difficult, represented a significant sacrifice for them. But they were dedicated and faithful disciples that were committed to doing all that they felt God was asking them to do. And their faith inspires and blesses me. Their courage and their dedication has been passed down through each succeeding generation. They certainly raised up seed unto God. And I'm, I'm proud, I'm grateful to say that I'm part of that seed. Now, let's move on to problem number three. And to introduce this problem, uh, the problem of prejudice, right, uh, is to bring in a large pile of pennies. And for an icebreaker, show your class the pennies and ask in what ways the pennies are different from each other. Well, you can see some are lighter, some are darker. Some are newer, some are older. Some have different dates stamped on them. Some were minted in different locations. They certainly don't all have the exact same appearance. But then I'd ask, how much is each penny worth? The same. They are equal in worth, regardless of the outward appearance. How are people like? All people are of equal worth, regardless of any differences in their outward appearances. And I believe that this is how God sees all of his children. Different, very different, but of equal worth. Consider your answers to the following questions. Is an American soul worth more than a French soul? Is a female soul worth more than a male soul? Is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ's soul worth more than a Muslim's soul? Is a sinner's soul worth more than a righteous person's soul? Is a prophet's soul worth more than a primary child's soul? Is your friend's soul worth more than your enemy's soul? 
Is a one-year-old soul worth more than a 90-year-old soul? The answer to each of these questions is a resounding no. But we often struggle to come to those conclusions. Or the way that we treat different types of people betrays our inner biases. Differences too often divide us, and the Nephites here are struggling with that issue. Jacob is going to try to help them out, and in the process, he's going to help us out too. You can see the problem introduced in verse 5, chapter 3. Hate and prejudice. Their justification for this prejudice appears to be twofold. One, Lamanite cultural differences, which the Nephites perceive as, to use their word, filthy. Enos gives us a good description of some of these cultural differences. The Lamanites were more of a nomadic people, it seems. He says, dwelling in tents and wandering about the wilderness with a short skin girdle about their loins and their heads shaven, and many of them did eat nothing save it was raw meat. The second source of prejudice had to do with the physical difference. Uh, quoting Jacob, the darkness of their skins. Today, we call this racism which is a major problem in societies all around the world and has caused much pain and conflict in many countries and contexts in the modern era. Technically speaking, the Nephites and the Lamanites are of the same race. But the point is still the same. We must stop making value assessments of one another based on physical or cultural characteristics, regardless of what those may be. Jacob's words are extremely relevant to us. And basically, Jacob's answer is simply, stop it, <laughs> right? But then he gives us three very important principles for overcoming prejudice and hate. Can you use your problem-solving skills to find them in verses 5 through 7 and then verse 9? 5 through 7, Jacob says, Behold the Lamanites, your brethren, whom ye hate because of their filthiness and the cursing which hath come upon their skins, are more righteous than you. For they have not forgotten the commandment of the Lord, which was given unto our father, that they should have, save it were, one wife, and concubines they should have none, and there should not be whoredoms committed among them. And now this commandment they observe to keep. Wherefore, because of this observance, in keeping this commandment, the Lord God will not destroy them, but will be merciful unto them. And one day they shall become a blessed people. Behold, their husbands love their wives. And their wives love their husbands, and their husbands and their wives love their children. And their unbelief and their hatred towards you is because of the iniquity of their fathers. Wherefore, how much better are you than they in the sight of your great Creator? Do you see what Jacob is doing here? One way to overcome prejudice is to look for the good in other people. Talked about this before already. This is a theme of the Book of Mormon to look for the good in their culture, their religion, their appearance, and to not judge those differences in terms of better or worse. The Nephites were only focusing on the differences and what they perceived as negative. Well, how about the differences in the positive? How are they better? Is there room for some envy in that culture, in that people? Now, I've had the opportunity to travel to many places in the world and Meet people from lots of different backgrounds, cultures, religions. And you want to know something? They are all full of goodness. Lots of good. That's where we place our focus. We tend to find what we look for. And in all religions and people and cultures, if we only look for the bad, we're sure to find it, even in our own. But when we begin to recognize the good in others... The barriers come down. My father spends a lot of time now traveling the world as a tour guide. He's, he's out of the country more than he is in the country these days. And his job is to teach other travelers about the cultures and the religions of all the countries that they're visiting. His approach is to always show them the amazing and wonderful and beautiful things that all of these cultures have to offer. And he, he tells a particularly sweet story when he was in China teaching the tour group about the beauty of Chinese poetry and literature and art and culture. And he's totally sincere in his love for these things. He speaks with great passion 
and appreciation for these things. Near the end of the tour, he walked over to the, the Chinese escort and he said, I want to thank you as a representative of your culture and people for how you have enriched my life. And the man put his hand over my dad's heart and he said with, with great warmth, Chinese, Chinese. My father said that it was one of the greatest compliments he'd ever been given. The best tools that we have for overcoming hatred, bigotry, and prejudice is to look for the good and to express that good. When you do that, just watch the walls come down. It works. Perhaps therein lies the solution to most of the world's most serious problems. A second principle comes at the end of verse 7. Jacob asks a question. How much better are you than they in the sight of your great creator? We know the answer to that question. We're no better. I'd respond with Doctrine and Covenants 18.10. Remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Or with 2 Nephi 26.33. We looked at a couple weeks ago. All are alike unto God. Maybe we could just remember that the next time that we're feeling superior in some way to somebody else. In God's eyes, in his sight, the sight of our great creator, our value is equal. Finally, the third principle that I see comes in verse 9. Ye shall remember your own filthiness. If we want somebody to judge, we need to look no further than the bathroom mirror. And that's the only time where we ought to maybe consider looking for the bad and not to beat ourselves up, but so that we can change it so that we can work on things. Remember our own filthiness and not look for it in other people. Overall, there is simply just no excuse for a disciple of Jesus Christ to justify hatred, prejudice, discrimination, racism, or bigotry. There just isn't. Jacob is very emphatic about that. And these are people that were their enemies that they were fighting against in war. To quote President Nelson, Each of us has a divine potential because each is a child of God. Each is equal in his eyes. The implications of this truth are profound. Brothers and sisters, please listen carefully to what I am about to say. God does not love one race more than another. His doctrine on this matter is clear. He invites all to come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. I assure you that your standing before God is not determined by the color of your skin. Favor or disfavor with God is dependent upon your devotion to God and His commandments and not the color of your skin. Truth, to avoid the trap of prejudice, look for the good in all. Remember that all are alike unto God, and if you're going to judge anybody, judge yourself. For it I will go and do. I think it'd be worthwhile to take a hard look at ourselves and our own attitudes, to have a bit of a uh, Lord, is it I kind of experience. Let's not spend our time looking for problems that other people have with prejudice, but for problems that we might have with. So maybe we could ask ourselves, can you think of any areas where you might be tempted to prejudice? It may not be racial prejudice, but is it ethnic, religious, Economic, gender, political. There's a lot of different ways that we may be tempted to prejudge people. And now, think of something good about that person or that group of people. What is it? Remind yourself that they are beloved children of God and commit yourself to seeing them that way the next time you interact with them. And now think of areas that you need to work on. What can you do? to be a better disciple, to be a better person. And then one additional question here, what more can you do to be a part of the solution to prejudice and not a part of the problem? Well, I, I love history and I love learning about the past, but there's one thing about studying history that's quite discouraging. It's the part of history that I don't like. And that is that there is so much evidence of prejudice and racism and hate in it. In our world's history, war, violence, oppression, slavery, religious conflict, discrimination, 
pogroms, genocides. The long, sad story of man's inability to love his neighbor as himself. It's a bit depressing to think of how much hate fills our history. I pray that we, as disciples of Jesus Christ and members of his restored church, that we will always be a part of the solution, that we that we'll be examples to the rest of the world of the ideas of, of acceptance and tolerance and love, that we'll find ways to see all of God's children the way that he sees them. I mean, even our history isn't free from it. I hope we can all seek to be, to be good examples of this and remember that the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Now, there is one other problem that I believe you could address in these chapters, but I'm going to cover it briefly. It's a very serious problem and unfortunately prevalent in our world. But let's take a quick look at the description of the wives and the children of these Nephite men in chapter 2, verse 35. Behold, ye have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites, our brethren. You have broken the hearts of your tender wives and lost the confidence of your children because of your bad examples before them. And the sobbings of their hearts ascend up to God against you. And because of the strictness of the word of God, which cometh down against you, many hearts died, pierced with deep wounds. And I don't know, maybe I'm assuming things or maybe I'm stretching the scriptures. I hope not. But that sounds to me like a fairly accurate description of those that are victims of abuse. Do the scriptures provide any advice for people who are victims of abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, or sexual abuse? What's the Lord's message to them? I think chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, has some incredibly wise words of counsel to victims of abuse. But behold, I, Jacob, would speak unto you that are pure in heart. I think it's important that he addresses them as the pure in heart. There's a message in that. Often the abused person doesn't feel very pure. Jacob reassures them that they are. The sinful use of somebody else's agency has no bearing on your purity and your standing before God. Only theirs. Look unto God with firmness of mind. Don't let the abuse damage your trust and faith in God. He's there, and you can look to him with confidence in his love and his awareness. And pray unto him with exceeding faith. Pray, ask and ye shall receive. Seek his help on your knees and find a connection with your Father in heaven. And then Jacob has some promises for you if you do. He will console you in your afflictions, and he'll plead your cause. God's on your side. He'll stand up for you at the judgment and send down justice upon those who seek your destruction. Remember that God is a God of justice. Often victims of abuse feel that there is no justice. But know that those responsible for your pain, at least in an eternal sense, will be held accountable. Justice will be served. O oh, all ye that are pure in heart, Lift up your heads, so don't hang it down in shame or defeat, and receive the pleasing word of God. Find strength and comfort and counsel in the word of God's scriptures, in the Holy Ghost, trusted church leaders, family, friends. And feast upon his love, for ye may. Many times, the abused person, especially if it was done by a family member, feel that they can't trust love anymore. But there is a love that you can trust forever. That's God's love. And that love is infinite and assured and abundant. You can feast on it. It's there for you. I feel that that is some really good counsel to victims of abuse. Since we're on the subject of abuse, there's one other small story in the Book of Mormon that I feel also offers some important advice to those who are victims of abuse. We're going to do this here. It's in Alma chapter 50, verses 30 through 31. This story comes from the war chapters, where Captain Moroni is facing a group of dissenters led by a man named Morianta. And behold, they would have carried this plan into effect, which would have been a cause to have been lamented. But behold, Morianton, being a man of much passion, 
Therefore he was angry with one of his maidservants, and he fell upon her and beat her much. And it came to pass that she fled and came over to the camp of Moroni and told Moroni all things concerning the matter and also concerning their intentions to flee into the land north. Well, what a brave young woman. She was the victim of abuse. So what did she do? Three important things. She fled. She didn't allow the abuse to continue. She went to a trusted individual, and she told him all things concerning the man. Now, heaven forbid that this applies to anybody out there. But if you are the victim of abuse right now, I encourage you to follow the example of Morianton's maid. Flee. Get away. Find somebody that you trust and tell them all things concerning the matter. Don't allow the abuse to continue. Now, if you haven't noticed, this lesson is full of some very difficult issues. Materialism, sexual immorality, plural marriage, prejudice and racism, and abuse. I, I, I assure you that I've tried very hard to be thoughtful and sensitive. And if I've offended anybody out there, I assure you that it's unintentional. And if you teach these topics, please be cautious, sensitive in how you approach them. And that will conclude our lesson for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you felt the Spirit. I hope the Spirit and the Scriptures taught you something today. If you felt that you gained something from this, I encourage you to share this with somebody else that you feel it could help. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.